Hi, everybody. I'm Robert Franz, music director of your Windsor Symphony Orchestra, and I am here today to talk to our soloist, Amy Lay, who is performing Debussy's Dances, Sacred and Profane with the Windsor Symphony Orchestra. Good morning, Amy. How are you today? I'm doing really well. Thank you, Robert. Good. I am so excited that you're going to be joining us. Now, our audience knows you because you play in the orchestra. You're our principal harpist with the Windsor Symphony Orchestra. But for this particular juncture, this particular piece, you'll be stepping out from that role and being a soloist with the orchestra. Talk to us a little bit about what that means to you. What is it like to like move from playing in the orchestra to, to becoming a soloist with an orchestra? Well... It's a lot more nerve wracking. <laughs> no, it's, it's a, I'm so excited to have this opportunity to share this beautiful piece with everybody. Um, and, you know, when you're in the orchestra, you're a team player, you're listening, you're thinking about how you fit into all the pieces. But as a soloist, you get the opportunity to set your own tempos, kind of uh, decide a little bit of how things are going to flow. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very exciting. So talk to me a little bit about when, you know, I'm always amazed by harpists in an orchestra because quite often, more often than not, you don't have the melody. You're not sort of the lead voice. You're usually sort of adding embellishments and colors and sort of helping to sort of frame the, the orchestra. What is that like to sit in the back of the orchestra and to sort of embellish in that way or sort of be that part of the sound? Um, well, I've actually played in the orchestra as a violinist back in high school, as well as a harpist. And the harp is such a unique instrument in that it creates so many different, what we would call colors, different timbres. Um, and so I think as in the, in the orchestra, you're constantly trying to fit those certain colors into the um, broader tapestry of the piece, so to speak. Yeah. But, the playing of the instrument itself always seemed like a bit of a mystery to me. As we can see in the video right now, there are three different color strings. Can you explain the different colors? Absolutely. So the harp is similar to a piano in a lot of ways. Um, there's actually a really great YouTube clip of Harpo Marx that reaches inside of a grand piano and pulls it out and starts playing it like a harp. Um, don't recommend it. <laughs> recommend that but um, the, it, it's similar in that it's set up like the musical alphabet and all of the C strings are red and all of the F strings are blue okay but what what if you wanted a C sharp how does that work right so this is the mystery of the harp um, and I'll give you a little historical background so uh, in ancient Egypt, uh, how long do you have? No, just kidding. <laughs> but the, the harp is one of the oldest instruments um, known to man. But for the majority of its lifetime, up through the Baroque period and the classical period, it was really quite limited as to how many sharps or flats that you were able to, to use. So the, being like the black keys on the piano. So for the most part, um, you would only be able to adjust each string by a half step, by a little bit. Um, but it, that really limited the number of keys that it could play in. And as music got more and more complicated, uh, it hit a ceiling as far as what kind of repertoire it could play. So um, during the uh, turn of the century in the 1900s, uh, they developed this instrument, which is called the double action pedal harp. So for every note of the scale, <laughs> A, B, C, D, E, F, G, there is a corresponding pedal down at the bottom. Um, and each pedal is attached to two discs outlying every string. So if this is my C string, I can have it as long as possible, making it as low as possible, which is C flat. If I push the pedal down one notch, then one of the discs engages and shortens the string. So the shorter the pitch, the higher. So now we have C natural. And then I push it down one more time, that's the double action, and I get a C sharp. So throughout the whole piece while I'm playing, you can also see my feet just going crazy with the voice. Well, and I was just going to say that because I think audiences don't always get to see, like audiences are mesmerized by harpists. They love to watch your hands do the glissandos, but the real yes. interesting part I mean, not that that's not interesting, Amy, but the real interesting <laughs> part is what's happening with the foot pedals down below. And that's kind of the mechanism of it. And um, so that's why it's so incredible to me when a harp part is particularly complex. 
It also is sort of interesting because it means that if you're a composer and you're writing a piece for harp, you really have to understand that. Have you ever run into a situation where a composer maybe didn't understand the mechanism of the pedals versus the fingers? And, and how did you overcome it? Yes, definitely. Um, I mean, for the most part, I think composers tend to be a little shy of the harp. So I'd like to encourage <laughs> them to go ahead and write the sharps and the flats and we can usually figure it out. Um, but Sometimes, I mean, without going into too much details, the pedals are organized in a way that you have some with your left foot and some with your right foot. And if you have a lot of pedals that I'm going to have to do with my right foot at a fast pace, you're just like, mm -hmm. that's not quite possible. So it does have some limitations as far as its chromatic abilities, for sure. Now, the piece that you're going to play for us has a little bit of a story. So it's, it's by uh, Claude Debussy, the French composer, and it was commissioned by... Uh, a, a piano making company, the Plyo company. And what's interesting about that company was that was the company that created the first upright piano a hundred years before this was, was, was uh, written. And also it was the company that provided Chopin with his pianos and Chopin loved those, those Plyo pianos, right? Isn't that fun? But yeah. so apparently around 1900 or so, somebody invented this thing called a chromatic harp which looks different than the harp you're playing. And that was why they commissioned this piece, because they wanted a composer, Debussy in this case, to write a piece for this new chromatic harp. Tell us about that instrument that was created and how it sort of is the same or different from the one that you're playing on. Okay. Boy, you know your history on the harp. I'm impressed. I'm learning. <laughs> so as I had said, uh, for the most part of the harp's life, it was... Uh, very limited and then we hit this period where music is getting more complex and so they were trying to develop an instrument that could handle all this chromatic uh, changes. So the interesting part about the WC that I'll be playing is that it was kind of part of a battle between harps. There were two models at the time, um, two companies, the Playel and the Erard company, who had both designed a, a harp model that was completely different. So I've explained to you the double action pedal harp. And then here's this other company, the Playel company, who created the harp chromatique or the chromatic harp, which their approach was um, to bypass the pedals altogether and to create one string for every note, essentially, on the piano. And in order to do that, there were two sets of strings that crossed in the middle, um, which I have never actually played a chromatic harp. Uh, they, can, they were pretty much obsolete uh, by the 1950s, but they were apparently very heavy, cumbersome, and I just I can't imagine having to keep track of, of all of those strings. Uh, but Debussy, one of the most uh, well-known French composers at the time, was commissioned by one company to write a piece, the dance Sacré Profane. And at the same time, Ravel, the other most prominent French composer at the time, was commissioned to write a piece for the double action pedal harp to just showcase each one. And Ravel won, <laughs> but we were left with this wonderful, beautiful piece of music uh, that is now part of standard harp repertoire. I love that idea of competing uh, pieces for competing harps and competing technology. You know, we often think our technology is moving so fast today that we must, you know, this is supposed to all be new, but there are many points in history where technology was in the same sort of, you know, this is yeah. like... Uh, this is almost like Apple versus uh, Android in terms of telephone, I right? I know. I was just thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the concerto that you're going to play, Debussy's dance is sacred and profane, is, is made up of two movements. The first movement is the secret uh, movement. The second one is the profane music. And, and in case our audience is concerned that there'll be profanity at this concert, the case is not so much. <laughs> Basically, this is the French version of the word. So what it'll mean is that the first movement is more heavenly and celestial, and the second movement is more sort of earthly. In fact, it's based on sort of a Spanish dance. It's kind of got that sort of folksy kind of feel to it. Tell us a little bit about the piece from your perspective, your relationship to the piece, what it's like to play it, and what audiences can expect when they hear this piece. Okay, so like I mentioned, the, um, this piece is part of the standard harp repertoire. Uh, most harpists learn this at some point in their professional career, and I started this piece uh, back in university um, and have had the chance to live with it for a while, which is good because this piece of music was really breaking the boundaries in a lot of ways at the time. Um, Debussy, uh, well, he was actually not a, a super favorite composer at the Paris Conservatory. There's a story that 
that uh, one of the teachers at the Paris Conservatory said if, any, if he ever saw a score of his work, Peleus and Melisande, then that student who had the score would be um, is thrown out of the <laughs> thrown out of the conservatory, and in fact, apparently, some poor student brought it in, and, and sure enough, he was he was ousted. Uh, but these rules that he was breaking um, have to do, in some ways, are, are with these parallel fifths, uh, uh, which even in university you're taught when you're writing harmony, don't do that. But it, the piece starts off with all these parallel fifths. So as a music student learning how to work with this type of piece, this type of harmony, um, it, did, it does take some time to grow with it and, and to be able to express through this French um, impressionist uh, kind of music. So um, for our audience that's thinking, um, gosh, I love the harp. I can say that this is probably one of the best examples of just hearing and seeing the harp. In fact, the way you're going to be set up is going to be sort of in the center because we're performing this at All Saints Church. You're going to be performed. You're going to be set up kind of in the center of the orchestra, surrounded by this, um, surrounded by love. And um, so we're very much looking forward to hearing hearing that. Um, question for you so so in addition to that you do in addition to playing with the windsor symphony you play with orchestras across michigan you also started an organization called fourth wall talk to us a little bit about this group because many of our um, audience members in windsor essex county will know you from the fourth your fourth wall activities thank you yes um so fourth wall started about six years ago um it's a, a professional chamber music series Chamber music is sometimes known as the music of friends, um, and it, it gives you the opportunity to get, get a little up close and personal with some of the most beautiful repertoire written for small groups of musicians. So that's what uh, chamber music is, just the smaller groups. Um, and we engage with our audiences uh, through education and interaction and collaboration with um, other artists in the community of all different genres. Uh, which, as you know, we are so lucky to have so much great talent here in Windsor. And uh, I thank the Windsor Symphony so much for hosting many of our programs at the beautiful Capitol Theater downtown. Um, and we will be presenting our, our first broadcast on November 29th with uh, music of 1945, with a couple of great classical music, chamber music gems, as well as some jazz and pop of that year uh, performed by the Coffee House Combo. Fun. So, yeah, it is fun. It's a different, different thing for me to be on the organizational side of, of an organ of, of a group as opposed to just performing. So, now I have fun. a funny question for you, sort of a basic question. But what what is the fourth? What is the fourth wall? Yes. So the fourth wall <laughs> is that imaginary <laughs> wall between the audience and the performer. So I... through all these exercises, we're working on get, breaking down the fourth wall. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that education and teaching is a huge part of your life. You have students of all ages and all from all sort of walks of life. Talk to me a little bit about that process. I would think that just going out and buying a harp for a family is not something that families do, especially if a child is not yet sort of clear on like, okay, I want to be a harpist. It seems like a bit of an investment. What do you, how do you teach students? How does that work if not everyone has an instrument or do they? Well, if you're going to study the harp, you have to have some sort of harp. So uh, there are, but it does not have to be this big, beautiful yeah. um, harp. But usually, students start on a much smaller instrument that they rent. Um, if there's a will, there's a way. I mean, when I was, yeah. I didn't start the harp until I was 16. Uh, but you know, you go to your mom and you're like, I want to, I want to play the harp, and they're like, What? It's like saying, I want a pony. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> But there, but there is a way, and I have students from age five to eighty-five on the harp that I teach wow. uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, but then I also teach a great program called Music for Young Children, uh, which is a wonderful way to, way to introduce um, kids to music foundations uh, from the ages of three to ten. Um, uh, they come and learn uh, listening and singing as well as their piano skills. So starting on the piano is always a good idea too. Very cool. So what uh, what attracted you to the harp? Why did you choose the harp? 
Um, well, I had started playing the piano when I was four, um, coming from a household whose musical soundscape was more along the lines of Michael Jackson and the Beach Boys. <laughs> but I started the piano and I uh, just wasn't, was one of those children who, whose parents never had to tell them to go practice. I just loved practicing. It was my space. It was like a little adventure. I'm not sure I practiced well, but, um, but it, was a, it was a love of mine. And then I started the violin um, in our fifth grade strings program. I was lucky enough to have a, a music program there and that allowed me to play in the orchestra. Which I'm so glad that the Windsor Symphony also has a youth orchestra. It's such a great opportunity to belong and participate in something like that. And then at 16, um, my school went to see an education program similar to the ones that the Windsor Symphony offers to hundreds of kids in this community. And sure enough, there's a harpist there. And there was something about the shape and the sound that just completely transfixed uh, me. And um, at some point, my, I, I, I'm from Michigan and uh, lived near Michigan State. And my mother called and said, my daughter's life will have no meaning unless she can play the harp. And they <laughs> actually gave me an instrument to borrow and get started with on lessons. So that's how I got wow. started. Wow, how yeah. cool is that? That is totally lucky. awesome. Well, Amy, I am so grateful that you spent this time with me. And I am also so much looking forward to making music with you. I love making music with you every chance I can inside the Windsor Symphony. And this is our first chance to do it with you as soloist. So thank, thank you, thank you. you, thank you for being part of this concert. It's my absolute pleasure. I can't wait. I'm very excited. Perfect.